Amen. <clears throat> We're thankful for what God has done. I'm grateful that even if God did nothing else but what we just sang, it'd be enough. But aren't you glad that he's the one who cures diseases? Aren't you thankful he's the one that sustains us? He's the one that gives us strength. He's the one that does the impossible in our life. And so I'm grateful uh, for that example in Brandon's life. Uh, church family, I'm grateful for you all. I hope you realize um, just what has, has gone on over the past year. Um, you know, just, just being very straightforward, there, there are a lot of uh, churches in the country, um, in our state, uh, probably in our county, that if, if they would have walked through uh, a season like we have, um, that they would not have made it through uh, nearly as, as well as Wade has. And I, this is not me jinx. I don't want to jinx anything. But the fact that this season has been a season where we've seen God still do things in our church, that there's been unity in the church, um, I, I'm grateful for the Lord maintaining that unity, but I'm also grateful for you all. A lot of foolishness can happen whenever the pastor's gone. But I'm grateful that that hasn't been the case here. And I think part of it is a testimony to the leadership that Wade has had over the past couple of years. I'm very thankful for Pastor Brandon. Um, I cannot tell you how much so. I'm very thankful for Phil. I'm very thankful for our staff. Um, but I'm thankful for our members because it is your faithfulness that has helped us maintain unity. And so uh, I'm, I'm just, I just want to say thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful that we have made the main thing the main thing, and the main thing is to make much of Jesus. Um, and so we're, we're excited uh, for the prospect of, of Brandon being back, uh, thankful that uh, we're at a place where I, I would consider this light at the end of the tunnel maybe, um, but grateful that, uh, that he, is, he is doing well. And so I want to invite you to meet me in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. We're going to be looking at one verse today, verse number 8. And uh, we're, we're at the point of the Beatitudes where I, I think it is, uh, it is important to remind you that uh, whenever Jesus was, uh, was unpacking the Beatitudes, whenever he was uh, sharing the Beatitudes with his followers, that uh, th- this, he was not sharing these things as a list of uh, of moral obligations that we just simply check off. And uh, once, we, once we finish uh, Beatitude number seven, we can move on to number eight. Uh, but all of these Beatitudes are truths about kingdom citizens. This is a manifesto of sorts of what makes up a kingdom citizen. And so we, we, don't, uh, we don't become these things perfectly and fully here on this earth, but the idea through sanctification, is that we are in the process of becoming these things. Um, that this is not uh, what we do in order to uh, receive salvation, but if we have placed our faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, then this is, this is the fruit that we exhibit. Uh, if, if our faith is in Christ and his righteousness, then at some point we have to uh, be aware of our spiritual poverty. We have to grieve for our sin. We have to uh, hunger and thirst for, for Christ, um, and in so doing, we, we exhibit the hallmarks of a kingdom citizen. And so in Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 8, Jesus gives us another beatitude. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, to all of my perfectionists in the room, you probably read that and you think, okay, well, what all do I need to do to be perfect? What all do I need to do to be pure? What, what all do I need to do to be without spot and without blemish? If, if we uh, read this, uh, initially our thought may be that this is uh, a weight that's tied around our ankles that uh, we can't uh, bear. Uh, but hopefully by the end of our conversation today, what we uh, will come away with is uh, a view of this beatitude 
uh, the intent that Jesus had in saying this that will hopefully encourage us, that will hopefully uh, free us uh, to live in the grace of, of God. But initially, <clears throat> we do see uh, a problem that we must contend with in this beatitude. Jesus addresses a matter of the heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. <clears throat> and there's a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of ideology. There's a lot of, a lot of quotes. There's a lot of uh, anecdotes that uh, are, are going around our culture these days uh, that would say something along the lines of, well, whenever you don't know what to do, just trust your heart. Follow your heart. Listen to your heart, and you'll never go wrong. Can I tell you, that's a bunch of heart garbage. <laughs> like, we, we can't follow our heart because our heart, because of the fallenness of the world, is, is flawed. Jeremiah chapter 7, he says that the heart of all is deceitful. So there's a problem if we prescribe to this, to this notion of, I'm, I'm just going to follow my heart, and it's never going to lead me wrong. It, it is. And you may be sitting there thinking, well, I have a good heart. I'm a good-hearted person. That's your heart lying to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. The heart is deceitful above all. And there's a reason why Jesus leans into this, because we see in, in Scripture, if we look at the whole picture of Scripture, that the problem with the heart is that the heart truly represents what we are. We see that played out in the calling of David as king. Remember Solomon, uh, whenever Saul had, had kind of uh, uh, flamed out in uh, his role as king, and it was, it was obvious that Israel needed another king, and Samuel was sent to Jesse. <clears throat> and all of these, these impressive-looking sons was paraded in front of Samuel. And Samuel thought, okay, well, surely this guy, I mean, he's tall, dark, and handsome. Like, this guy looks the part. But God tells Samuel this in 1 Samuel 16, 7. He says, don't look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. So if he looks good on paper, like, don't, don't just believe that. The Lord says, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. I think if, if there was a scary passage of Scripture in the Bible, it's this one. Because we, are, we work so hard to put on a mask. We, put, we work so hard to make sure that our lives look ordered, that, that our lives look put together. We, we live in a, in a culture where uh, life is lived largely on social media. And can I tell you, you can trust nothing on social media. This, these highly filtered lives where we get snapshots of people's life, of their vacations that just make us just angry. I hate whenever people post pictures of food because I'm always hungry and I always want to leave and just eat something. So if, please don't, don't post a picture of your lunch today because it's going to make a brother stumble. But, but we see that life is lived, this perception of what a good life looks like is, is, is portrayed largely through the lens of social media. This filtered life that we, we let people see what we want them to see. And, and even if we, we don't do that in social media, we do that in church every week. We put on the mask of everything is awesome. That there's no place for hurt, there's no place for lament, there's no place for my failure, there's no place for, for me to be authentic and real about what's going on in my life. But the scary part is that God sees past that. So on one hand, we can be liberated from the, this, this prison of looking good, looking like you have everything together, and realize that, man, God, God knows you. God knows the struggle that you have, ha have gone through this week. God knows the sin that you've committed. And, and guess what? He still loves you. But the scary part is he sees what's in my heart. And what's in our heart defines who we are. What's in our heart defines what we do. We do what we do because we want what we want. 
I mean, James chapter 4, he, he, said, he says this. He says, he asks the question of where, where does strife come from? Where, do, where does sin come from? Well, well, sin comes from the passions that we have in our hearts. We all have motivating desires that make us do what we do. So the issue is our heart desires. The issue is that our heart is easily led astray to false idols. That's why Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. So the heart truly represents what we are. And it also, uh, uh, from our heart come the actions of our life. Matthew chapter 15, verse 18. Jesus says this. He says, But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. So our actions come from the heart, and our actions represent the content of our heart. Luke chapter 6, verse 45 says, The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's a scary thought, y'all. What is our mouth speaking? Do, do we... Do we generally just explain away, oh, well, I, I'm just a harsh person. But I, I, I really have good intentions. Well, can I tell you that if what comes out of your mouth is regularly harshness, then what that means is there's an issue in your heart. If you say, well, I just, I just get angry from time to time, but I'm not an angry person. If anger comes out of your mouth, then what that means is there's anger in your heart. So the things that we say, the things that we do, it's not representative of just temporary struggles, but it's representative of the content of our hearts. Jesus says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now this this complicates things for us, right? Because we're thinking about this idea of blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, if, if there's a, a fundamental problem with our heart, what do we do with it? H- how is there hope in this beatitude? I mean, you know, we have no other choice but to read this beatitude and, and feel a, a bit hopeless, feel a bit of self-loathing because I can't change my heart. But I, I think it's important here to understand what Jesus is talking about and the context in which Jesus is talking about, I, I think we would consider the, the facts about our heart, that the heart is deceitful above all, and we would say, okay, right on, that, that fits with a kingdom citizen because the first beatitude, remember what it was? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. So we come to Christ acknowledging that our heart is deceitful, Above all, we mourn over the fact that our heart is deceitful. We mourn over the fact that we are subject to sin and that sin has corrupted our heart, corrupted our life, and corrupted our world. And so Jesus would say, hey, there is a place for you in my kingdom because the first thing that you have to realize is that you can't change your heart. But can I tell you who can? Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can change our heart. And so for, for Jesus to say, blessed are the pure in heart, it, it kind of makes sense because Jesus knows what he can do in our heart. Jesus, in this context, though, is not speaking of just cleanness of heart or a life of high moral standing. If, if that were all that Jesus was talking about, then, then we would feel the, the tension of the sin that we bear. The tension in the cycle of we, we come to church, we get encouraged, we we feel this, this urge, this impetus to go out and to, to defeat our sin, to be victorious over our sin. We're going to do what we have to do. We're going we're gonna to work harder. We're going to have seven days this week where we're in the Word and we're not going to get mad. We're not going to say the things to our spouse or to our kids that we typically say in anger. We're going to have a good week. And then Monday hits. And it's like Mike Tyson once said, And everybody has a plan whenever they get into the ring, but then you get punched in the face. Monday comes, and it's the day after you spring forward, and so you're feeling really, really angry at life. 
the coffee's not caffeinated enough, the cinnamon roll doesn't have enough cinnamon on it. Everything is just off, and the first thing you do is you snap at your spouse, you snap at your kids, you do something you don't really feel proud of on your commute to work because you're angry at the crazy people that are driving the I-10 bridge. And what happens is you get to the end of the week and you have all of these things that you look back on and you think, man, I, the thing that I said that I wanted to do on Sunday, that I was going to be better, I was going to do better, I did none of that. And so if, if, if what Jesus was, was talking about here was simple uh, moral perfectionism, then, then yeah, we would feel the weight of this. And, and that's not to say that there isn't a life change that, that has to happen whenever we give our life to Christ. But Jesus is, is, is talking about purity in, in more than just a moral change. You know, the, the, this word pure that Jesus uses, uh, that there's two, two ways to look at it. One is, is to look at it as uh, that which is physically clean or pure, unsoiled from dirt. And we get that. The second way to look at it is that which is unmixed and unadulterated. That the main thing is the main thing. And, and I would argue that this is, this is actually what Jesus has in mind because there's a, couple of, uh, there's a number of, of things that Jesus says in his Sermon on the Mount that, that kind of point us back to that being the idea. Uh, remember the, the fact that he he begins his description of a kingdom citizen by addressing our spiritual poverty. He, he, he knows that we, we, even if we try our best, that our best is eventually going to lead to failure. That if we give our best effort, eventually we're going to swing and we're going to miss. Eventually we're going to fall to our sin. And so what Jesus is, has in mind here is, is not simply just you know, be physically clean and unsold from dirt, but he's he has in mind this idea of being unmixed, being focused, being singular focused. If we hunger and thirst for righteousness, then we're hungering and thirsting for him. So all, all, these, all the Beatitudes, they're connected together. They're building on one another. And so if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, then that implies that we hunger and thirst for the thing that can fill us, the thing that can satisfy us. And then we also look at Matthew 6.33, where Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So as, as Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, what he's not saying is blessed are the perfect, blessed are those who don't sin, blessed are those who always get it right, because in reality, not sinning doesn't get you into heaven. The, those that get into heaven are not those who never sin. But those who get into heaven are those who have dealt with their sin and God has accounted their debt as having been paid through the blood of Jesus Christ. John Owen says that in his, in his book, Mortification of Sin, he says that we're going to be killing sin, we're going to be fighting sin until the day that we die. There's not a day in our life that we won't have to contend with sin. And so what that means for us then is that there are going to be days where we fail. There are going to be days where we fall. And so how do we reconcile this idea of blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God? The way Jesus is talking about purity is purity is being single-mindedly approaching Christ being single-minded in our desire for Christ, being single-minded in our, our desire for the kingdom. In fact, C.S. Lewis says this. He says, It is safe to tell the pure in heart that they shall see God, for only the pure in heart want to. What is our desire? What does it look like for us to be pure in heart? Pure in heart means that we are singular and focused. There's a spiritual integrity that's implied when a person places their faith and hope in Jesus for justification. If we say that we're a Christian, then at some point we have to want to live like a Christian. Whenever, whenever I got married to Ann Carter, 
we didn't, we didn't have our wedding ceremony, and then the next week I was calling up my buddies to, hey, let's go, let's go meet some girls. I wasn't calling the, my, my ex-girlfriends saying, hey, you want to go grab dinner? But whenever I stepped into the covenant of marriage, my desire was I want to act like a married man. I, I say that I'm committed to this woman, and I'm committed to my Savior in the covenant of marriage. And so that implies that if I'm going to have integrity in my marriage, then I'm not going to act like I'm single. Same thing for our walk with Christ. If we say that our faith and hope is in the Lord, then the first thing that we have to do is we have to desire to act like a follower of Christ. We have to desire to live a life that, that bears the fruit of the grace of God. We are singular in mind. And so Scripture actually gives a lot of ink to this, to this topic. We see multiple places what it's not. In James 1, 6 through 8, James is talking about asking for wisdom. And he says, if anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask in faith with no doubting. But the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He says, but the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. To be double-minded is to say one thing and live another way. To say that your values are, one, are, are A and to live as if your values are B. And this thought is repulsive in Scripture. It's repulsive to our Heavenly Father. James goes on in James chapter 4, verse 8. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He says this, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So double-mindedness, hypocrisy is sin. To say one thing and live another. Scripture would say, hey, repent from that. Don't do that. Go, like, run away from that. Be a, a Christian of integrity. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you say that the Lord is your, uh, that Jesus is your Lord, then consider what that looks like in your life and desire that. So a pure heart is not defined by hypocrisy. A pure heart is not defined by unfaithful affections. Matthew, uh, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, he says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. U ultimately, it comes down to this. Who are you worshiping? Who do you want to worship? What is your God? Now, it's easy for us to, to look at our life and say, oh, well, obviously, Jesus. Like, I'm, I'm here, aren't I? Obviously, Jesus is the one that, that, that I want. But, but the, the question for all of us is, how, how does that play out in our actions? Do we actually live as if Jesus is our priority? I've, I've, learned, I've learned this in my life, and this is a lesson that um, I, I'm learning in terms of prioritizing the things that matter. It's easy for me to look at my life and say, well, I just don't have time for this thing that I need to be doing. Whenever, in reality, I know that the things that I love, I make time for the things that I love, I do. The things that I'm singularly focused on, I don't have to, I don't have to think twice about setting aside the things that, that don't matter, the things that aren't as important. And so the question for us is, what do we truly love? You know, purity of heart kind of looks like what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. His single-mindedness, Paul says in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, he says, Brothers, I don't consider that I have made it my own, but, but one thing I do. And all the things that Paul did, he says, the one thing I do, I forget what lies behind and I strain forward to what lies ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul's life was spent for this one thing. 
That's the one thing that he wanted. Now, was Paul perfect? Did Paul have a clean slate? No, there were things that Paul had to answer for. Paul was flesh and blood just like we are. Paul dealt with sin just like we do. That's why in Romans chapter 7, he says, Oh, wretched man that I am. Paul looks at his life, and even, even in the middle of writing the epistles, he says, Oh, wretched man that I am. Who can deliver me from my sin? But because Paul had a singular focus on Jesus Christ and him crucified, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So it's single-mindedness, not on, man, how can I be more righteous? How can, I, how, can I, how can I Christian harder? How can I Christian more effectively? But the singular focus that we have is, how can I be more focused on who I am in light of what God has done for me? How can my life be spent for the sake of the gospel? Romans 1.16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to salvation. So Paul was single-minded. He was gospel-centered. I love the verses preceding Philippians 3.13 and 14. And Philippians 3.4-11, through 11, he says, If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness under the law, blameless. This is what single-mindedness looks like here. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the, from the law. Paul is admitting, I can't change my own heart. My righteousness is not in my own works. My righteousness is a gift from God. That God has taken my sin, taken my debt, and he's given me his perfect righteousness because of his son. This is the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Single-minded, gospel-centered, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. How, how willing are we to look at the best things in our life? And I'm so grateful for all the blessings. I'm, I'm grateful for a home. I'm grateful for cars that get, it from, get us from place to place. I'm grateful to be able to go to restaurants and, and, and do the things that we enjoy doing. I'm thankful for my extracurricular activities. But am I willing to look at those things that I love and say, man, compared to Christ, that's rubbish. Compared to Christ, that's garbage. Not that these things are bad, but we're talking about how good God is. We're talking about how good Christ is, how worthy Christ is. That doesn't make these things bad, but if we're comparing anything to Christ, Anything else is expendable. Anything else is garbage. Are we willing to count everything else as rubbish? Paul was singularly minded. The gospel was of utmost importance to him because he knew that it was because of the gospel that his life was changed. And this is where we have hope. This is why we can read, Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Because those who, despite our struggles and sin, we, we have a single goal. Those, those who know Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It, it's, it's those who are pure in heart. Not because we're, we're focused on what can we fix in ourselves, but because we're focused on the one who saves us and who, who gave us an inheritance incorruptible and un, undefiled. That through Jesus we have the resurrection from the dead. We can attain the resurrection from the dead. We don't just know about it, but we're going to experience it. 
We not only know this in concept, but to, but to have hope in the reality that because of Jesus, one day this perishable is going to put on imperishable. This mortal is going to put on immortality. And one of these days, I, I, I'm going to know what it means to, to say, oh, death, where's your victory? I'm sorry, you got none. Jesus took it 2,000 years ago. That's the hope that we have. The pure in heart live this day in light of that day. They live this day longing for that day. We don't live this day wallowing in our sin, but we live this day confident in our hope, not in our own power, but in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And so whenever we read the beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, we can be filled with a whole lot of hope. This is a liberating thing but because as we pursue Christ, as we are singularly focused on the gospel, what we, realized, what we realize is that to see God, this means that we're reconciled in fellowship. That the thing that separates us from God is, is no longer there. Isaiah 58 says that our iniquity separated us from God. And so I think of the pure in heart. Kind of like, you know, being a dad has completely changed my life. Um, I'm pretty sure that if I was not bald before, I would be bald now. But being a dad has given me so much insight into how God is a heavenly father to us. And this idea of reconciled fellowship, this idea of, of a right view or belief in God, this idea of living my life in the blessing and comfort of his work in my life. Like, I, I look at, at Sylvie James, and I can't help but see, man, this is, this is an example of that. Because... She, I, I'm pretty sure she sees me as like a, a big teddy bear, like just a, another playmate. We love hanging out together. And, and can I tell you that she is horrible at hide-and-go-seek. Like, doesn't get it, but it's the cutest thing ever. Because what she does is she says, Daddy, find me. And she sits in the middle of the living room. And covers her head with a hand towel. And she says, okay, you hide. And then she counts. And then she's like, okay, you find me. And I'm like, is Sylvie James behind the couch? She says, no. Is Sylvie James in the kitchen? No. And then whenever I take the towel from her face, there's just this joy. She's just excited to see her dad. And her dad's excited to see her. Being pure in heart is knowing that we can be fully transparent and exposed before our Heavenly Father. And that on those days where sin racks our body, that God is faithful to take away the thing that separates us from him. And we don't have to cower in fear. But there's joy. Because there's delight and joy whenever we see God. And God never looks at us and despises us. And that's because of Jesus. That's because of the cross. That's because of the gospel. So the pure in heart, we don't run from God whenever we need to be disciplined. We don't run from God whenever we mess up. We know that because of his great love for us, we can run to him. So blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The question for us is, do we truly believe this? You know, I think for some of us, we, we can't wrap our mind around the fact that a holy, just, loving God, the God who's a consuming fire, the God who's a jealous God, the God who's perfectly 
loving and perfectly wrathful at the same time. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around the fact that he loves us like a good heavenly father. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around the fact that he doesn't look at us and just wants to be done with us. And I think that's where we struggle. The idea of being pure in heart can be liberating whenever we truly believe that God's work in our life isn't just justification, but it's sanctification. A pure heart is realized in the work of the Holy Spirit through sanctification. We are in the process of becoming. Do we truly believe that by the work of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God, that he cleanses our life? Do we truly believe that we're made clean because of his work? 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Titus 3, 4, and 5, Paul says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Our single, single mindedness is a result of the work of the Holy Spirit and God renewing our mind. So at the moment that we place our faith and trust in Jesus, we are sons and daughters of God. But the work that we do for the rest of our life until we get to heaven is that we are in need of the renewing of our mind and we're in need of cleansing over and over. A life of repentance. God is faithful to forgive. God is faithful to cleanse. And so the question for us as Phil and the team come forward is what... What is our focus? Have we we bought into this idea that we we are our own Savior to the point that we have completely forgotten about the grace of God? The reality is we can't manufacture a hunger for God. We're poor stewards of mercy and quite honestly left our own devices our heart will always pursue idols, with no exception. But there's good news. The good news is that God, being rich in mercy, when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. Because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, and then his work doesn't stop there. As Paul says in Philippians 1, he who began a good work in you will carry it through to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So the most important question that we can ask, the most important question that you can answer is how have you responded to the good news of the gospel? This good news that you can't fix your own heart that you do what you do because you want what you want and left to ourselves, we don't want Christ, but God, being rich in mercy, gives us salvation, extends to us grace, implants the Holy Spirit into our life, imputes righteousness to us and creates in us a renewed mind that all of a sudden we're not wanting the things that we used to want. We're wanting things that seek after Christ. We're wanting to live a life that seeks after Christ. You can't manufacture that. But Jesus in his grace can do that work in your life. So the call today is to respond to the good news of the gospel. The call today is if you've been living a life where your focus has been on Jesus and other things, that we repent and we set our hope and our affection squarely on the Son of God. If you've been working to check off the moral checklist, maybe today you need to surrender to God's work in your life. If every week just ends in self-loathing because you can't 
seem to, to conquer the sin that you're struggling with, know that Jesus has already conquered it. And he offers you victory through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. So what we're about to do, we're about to sing, we're about to, we're about to pray, we're about to sing. We're going to stand and I'll be here at the front. We'll have some encouragers here at the front who, who want to pray with you, who want to talk with you. These folks care about what God is doing in your life. So if you feel God nudging you, if you feel that pang of conviction, come and talk to somebody this morning. Don't leave without praying about what God is doing in your life and considering what God is doing in your life. But make today the day that you place your faith and hope fully in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your salvation. Lord, there's nothing that we could do to merit your grace. There's nothing we can do to merit justification. But Father, I thank you that you saw us in our sinful state. And because of your choice, you saved us. And so Lord, may we respond to that today, whether for the first time or to be reminded that we have hope <coughs> because it's God who creates in us a clean heart. So Father, do a work today in my life. Do a work today in the lives of our people. Father, we love you. We praise you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all stand and let's worship. Thank you.
Amen. I want to thank you for worshiping with us today. Um, just before you go, just a, a few announcements. I realized as I was looking at the announcements that my memory is not what it used to be, so I need a cheat sheet uh, for the next few, few weeks. Uh, just a reminder of what's coming up here uh, over the next month. Palm Sunday is April the 2nd. Uh, we'll have two services that Sunday, uh, Lord's Supper at both, uh, both gatherings. Um, also that day from 2 to 3.30 p.m., uh, we'll have the Great Hunt. So this is a family experience. Uh, we'll have an Easter egg hunt. We'll have some food. We'll have a cupcake walk. Um, all things that uh, adults love being a part of that even if you don't admit it, everybody loves a cupcake walk, right? Um, so come on out, uh, 2, 2 to 3.30. Um, we do need some volunteers uh, for that. So there's a sign-up in the hub. Uh, so we would uh, we'd love uh, to be able to partner with you. Um, also, if you, uh, if you have the spiritual gift of uh, baking really good cupcakes, um, now's your time. Uh, so uh, we, would, uh, we would love to be able to partner with you uh, on that as well. Uh, Easter Night of Worship is Wednesday, April 5th at 6.30. We'll all be here in the sanctuary for that night. And then our Easter schedule, Sunday, April 9th. Uh, for those of you who are keeping score, uh, it is the 9th this year. Uh, we'll have three services, one at 8.15, one at 9.30, one at 10.45 and no Sunday school. So uh, be praying about who you can visit. Um, also, the 26th of this month is Hospitality Sunday. Uh, pray for your one. Who's your one? Uh, we want uh, this season to be a season where uh, we, can, we can open the door for people to, to meet Jesus for the first time. So there's somebody that we know that needs to meet Christ. And so uh, let's, let's, let's be those people who point people to Christ. Um, so again, thank you for being here today. Um, on your way out, I just want to encourage you to continue uh, worship with the giving of your tithes and offerings. Uh, thank you for partnering with us to make ministry happen, uh, both here in our community and among the nations. And so let me pray for us, and then we'll be dismissed our Sunday school classes. Father, we just, uh, again, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for, uh, for your church. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that you would just use your church to, um, to build the kingdom of God here in the Hurley area. Um, Father, give us a good day. Give us gospel opportunities at some point today. Uh, Father, uh, we thank you for loving us. We pray that we would love you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.